Welcome to Rethinking Youth Ministry, where each week we hope to raise the bar for youth ministry by asking questions, interviewing thinkers, and having real, honest conversations about what it looks like to lead the next generation. I'm Sarah, and sitting around the table today, we have Crystal Chang. Hi! Tom Shunas. Hey, everybody. And Steve Underwood. Hello. And this is kind of like a part two of last week's podcast episode of When to Leverage Culture. And today we're going to be talking about how do you keep pace with student culture? So we're going to be answering that question. And Steve joined us for the first time last week talking about this. And we're going to continue to lean into his expertise when it comes to talking about culture and students. So again, the question we're trying to answer is how do you keep pace with student culture? So what would you say some of the tensions you think youth pastors and youth workers are feeling when it comes to engaging the student culture? I think for me, this all started in the the high school classroom where I was teaching because mm-hmm. I knew leveraging culture was a big deal. I knew that was something I wanted to do to keep their attention. And when I was 22 and started, it just came so naturally. Mm-hmm. I just felt like I had a natural understanding of what was going on, what words were cool, what songs were cool, what movies were cool. And as I got to know some of the teachers around me who had been doing it a lot longer, I realized even then there is probably an expiration date on me (laughs) understanding what is cool. And sure enough, friends, we have hit that expiration date. I do not naturally pick up on what is cool anymore. It's a lot more work than it used to be. And I think that's because as we age our interest age, but also Mm -hmm. because student culture just moves so unbelievably fast. Right. Yeah. I feel like as soon as I realized I aged out when we started watching the VMAs and I was like, it's too loud. I don't think I, (laughs) (laughs) well, I'm officially old. On the last VMAs that was just on, they did do a crowd shot and somebody was plugging their ears during the (laughs) So I would have fit in. I only watched the VMAs because I know Steve's watched it and it's great conversation. And you're going to be judged, which is my tension, which I just feel terrible at it. Right. You know, because I am terrible at it. And I I get that question. Did you watch the Teen Choice Awards last night? That's true. I'm like. No, I that was on. One, I didn't know it was on. Two, <laughs> right. I haven't gotten to watch a show I want to watch in 10 years. So, because <laughs> yeah. I've got kids in the house and we're watching w- other stuff. And then, and they don't watch the Teen Choice Awards, okay. which is interesting. That is interesting. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then, nor would I let them, I don't think. Yeah. But anyway, that's a whole separate conversation and a separate podcast. But um, I just feel terrible. I, I mean, I feel guilty all the time that I don't engage with culture, with teen culture, because, you know, my job is, is to do right. this. So it's, it's part of what I think that I'm not good at. And it takes a lot of work. It really does take a lot of work <laughs> because as you were saying, it was, it changes so fast. And I think that the interesting thing about youth culture today and, you know, Mark Ostriker came and spoke to our mm-hmm. staff about yep. youth culture and all of that. And the thing he talked about was his generation, the baby boomers generation mm-hmm. is the first generation not to aspire to old age, which was interesting. Was like interesting. they wanted to yeah. stay so young. Cool. And for the first time, pop culture became the prominent culture, which it can't be because, or mm-hmm. youth culture became pop culture right. and, and, the, and it was a prominent culture and youth culture can't be the prominent culture because it's always a reaction to, in his example, was it fractured? So not only is it changing nonstop, it's so diverse. I like, I don't even know where to start. Well, I, I loved when he talked about that. I was thinking about that as well, that it used to be that if you knew the popular culture for like the popular kids, right. but now there isn't really a popular kid. It's, it's just a football coach and the it's che- not the football, football player. And the, right, yeah. right. Now it's, you've got different fragments and fractions of yeah. students. And so you're not just trying to learn like, okay, what's like the most popular thing you're trying to figure out what's popular to this crowd and then this crowd and that it makes it. Yeah. A lot harder. I think we touched on this a little bit last time, but you had talked about social media, Crystal. And mm-hmm. I think, again, you know, the real challenging thing about all of this is, and Crystal hit the nail on the head, is that you want this to somehow be organic because otherwise they will know immediately that yes. you're like, hey, did you check out that, you know, that <laughs> that's not going to work. So it needs to be something where if it's not something you're naturally interested in, as we talked about last time, then, you know, find a group of people, find some people who understand that, who love it kind of surround yourselves with those people, you know, have them come into meetings periodically and just, again, just make it a conversation. Like, you know, what's going on? You know, what's, what are you really into? I mean, things like that, instead of trying to make it feel inauthentic, you know, and that's, and that's a really hard thing to do, you know, especially if you're not genuinely interested in it. 
But social media is where so many students are living their lives mm-hmm. that, you know, whether it's Instagram or Snapchat or whatever it may be, just even following students, you know, again, publicly and, and like you talked about, but that's a great way to see what the conversation is. So you can at least see what is happening. What are they watching? And if, if a show is happening, then it's going to spike in hashtags, wherever the case may right. be, wherever they're talking about, you're going to see that and you're, it, that will at least give you an inclination of what that conversation is broadly speaking. It seems like you're saying you have to posture yourself as a learner, that this isn't going to be something that's going to come naturally to all of us, but you've got to be willing to ask the questions to kind of learn from it. Because I I feel like in student ministry, when it comes to what we talk about, um, we are the authority, just given age and experience over our students when it comes to, you know, how to make better decisions or relationships because of our age, we're going to know more about them. But when it comes to culture, they are the authority on it more than we are. And so it kind of switches things up. And that makes it really hard, I think, for us as youth workers, because we don't necessarily know what's going on and we don't want to feel clueless or look clueless, but we are in a lot of ways. Right. And you're kind of I'm not sure if this is a good parallel, but you're kind of already doing this if you're married, for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, if your spouse is into something that you're not necessarily into, you still probably want to learn something about yeah. it. I mean, just as a connection point. So you're kind of already doing that naturally there or maybe even with a friend or something. So it's just an extension of that kind of thing. It's not just, again, an inauthentic, hey, let me just do my research and figure this out. It's like, I really do care about what you care about. I really want to know what you know. And so that's your starting point. It's not, hey, let me do my research so I can get on stage right. and say this really cool quote. You're coming from a place of, I genuinely care about what you care about. I think that's a really good point that if you're listening to this and thinking, I need to know about culture so I can look good in front of kids. Mm-hmm that's not going to work. They're going to sniff that out in a second. If you are, I need to understand culture so I understand how to connect them better. You know, one way I found to connect with students all the time is I ask them questions about, Mm -hmm. I've never seen that show. Tell me about that show. And they don't think, oh, the old man doesn't know anything. They really engage because they want to teach me about it. And, and, and I have found that it doesn't separate me from them. It it actually gets them excited and they engage, which leads to just, better questions. And so a lot of times they'll actually come to conclusions that I (laughs) had planned to ask, you know, them to come to later simply by engaging them in a conversation. And what you just said, I think is great, Sarah, by taking the position of being the learner in this Mm -hmm. situation. And they loved, they, I mean, where else do they get to tell anybody anything? Yeah. Tell us what to do (laughs) or what to watch or that's exactly what I've experienced with my own group of girls is they, they just really appreciate it when I ask those things. So when I say, hey, can you tell me what words are cool? Or I heard someone use this word. Is it weird when a 35-year-old right. says it? <laughs> what does this hashtag mean? And they mean? will yeah. tell you. What yeah. is a hashtag? Yeah, what is a hashtag? <laughs> <laughs> I had the conversation with my mother-in-law on email. She's like, I'm just not good at hashtags. I'm like, you just have to remember not to put spaces between you because uh, that's where it, <laughs> then it doesn't work because it's, stu- it's awesome. not working well I appreciate her effort that she was willing to want I mean, to let's do hashtags yeah that's good that's very impressive um, but you were basically saying we want to care about the things that the people you care about care about but that's it's got to right. feel genuine so that's a this culture because is a great per, way to do you're that. pursuing connection with those right. people not because you're pursuing that they want you want them to feel any different about you we right. are we we can't keep up with culture. Yeah. I mean, we can't keep up with all cultures, you right. know, within a youth culture. So it's, it's just, it's tough. And we all know what it looks like when the adult in the room tries a little too hard yeah. and you just don't want, yeah. you don't, wanna <laughs> you don't want to be that person. We train small group leaders like that all the time is like, you are a computer programmer right? during the week, be a computer yeah. programmer <laughs> on Sunday. Don't put on, you know, I always used to joke, you know, put on the gold chain and show up, you know, like, right. I don't know. I don't know. If it's not, it's not a gold the gold chain, chain thing. Is, is that not a thing anymore? <laughs> not a, it not depends really. on what culture we're talking to. Right. I think. That's and true. Uganda gold chains are huge. <laughs> I was that just old there. Uganda reference. Right. <laughs> Oh, you got it. The people in Uganda are going, he's so wrong. <laughs> All the Uganda <laughs> listeners will hear from him. Crystal, I love what you said about um, how your girls will tell you. And I made a note of that because you do that so well when you come back and, and you tell us about what your girls are telling you. And CJ does the same thing with his boys when we talk about what we'll put in a talk or something that we'll reference. And we're like, can we say that? Or does that sound stupid? Is that even a thing still? Or there's a new thing and we're like, 
I've never heard of that before, but apparently it's a thing. So we try to engage culture that way. You know, when I'm preparing a talk, I'm trying to figure out attention. Mm-hmm. I know my 44 year old male tension, right. you know, but I, I go down and ask my middle school. Yeah. I'm like, why have you ever felt this feeling? Yeah. And when did you feel this feeling? And he tells me about things that happen in hallways or, you know, yeah. with a teacher or whatever. And it's like, okay, that helps me, you know, really try to connect with the tension a kid would feel about an idea. So I do the same thing with my wife. I'm like, I know what a male right. would struggle with here, but what's the female version of that, you know, tension? So culture is no different, right? Well, Crystal's always doing a group chat with our girls while when we're day. brainstorming creative <laughs> meetings. Yeah. We're like, hey, ask your girls, what are they feeling when it comes to stress? <laughs> It's Can a great we still insight. Talk about fidget spinners? No, <laughs> okay. they're gone. They're gone. Well, and Steve has made this point before. In some ways, I think it's a unique challenge in the student ministry world as opposed to preschool and children's ministry. It is changing so fast, and we are releasing content six months in advance. And in some ways, you're like, "This is cool right now." In six months, this is going to be old news. So, how do we right. continue to talk about this in a way that's not making us sound outdated? Well, and I think, and, and again, I'm going back to something Crystal said, um, but even when you talked about in the last episode about uh, your small group girls and their playlists and they make playlists mm-hmm. for you. So you're upfront with, hey, I, I just need some cool playlists. It's not a research project. It's not a I'm trying to fit in. It's just simply, hey, I, I would love to he- you know hear some cool music. I don't dig through all of that. I don't know. And you're inviting them into that conversation with you, but you're not making it feel like a project. Right. And so for those right. those students who love it, again, and if you're a you know a, a student pastor, then or a, you know it's easy for you to say, hey, people on your team or people who are volunteers you're surrounded with or whoever it may be. I mean, music is one example, but that's an example to say, hey, I would just love for you to do that for me because I just want something to listen to, and that's right. a great way to start that conversation. Or you know, a Netflix watch list or, you know, with people you really know or whatever the case may be, but to allow them into that process for you where you admit, Hey, I don't know, but I would love to know just because personally I want to know. And I think that feels very real when you do it like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of my Spotify playlists right now, and my girls make Spotify playlists for me. Sure. But one of the ones that I listen to is one that Steve makes. Um, <laughs> and if you, if you don't follow the curriculum that we're all a part of, it's called XP three students. And part of that is we just create playlists that you can play in your environments mm-hmm. that won't get you fired. And that's part of Steve's job. And he goes to unbelievable lengths to make them relevant, which sometimes means finding out what songs are coming out before they come out right so that when you play them in your they're in your environment they're still new so i end up just using those on my yeah. own spotify account all the time so that i feel at least like i'm kind of cool even if i'm not striper playlist is oh. next to steve's <laughs> playlist and my spotify it's so, gonna show up next you know. season i'm That's taking right. notes i'll do that <laughs> <laughs> write it down right now striper i think another tension is the fact that I have heard so many youth pastors that don't feel the tension to understand Mm -hmm. culture and they just assume that the kid's culture is their culture, whether it's their current culture as a, you know, married man or woman, or whether it was the culture they faced when they were, they were kids. You should feel a tension of trying to understand what, what our kids are facing. Yeah. I felt like when we had Marco come, that was something else that I had a sense that youth ministry was different from when I was a kid, but to hear him really talk through how it's changed. I think we know that culture, secular culture has changed, yeah. but I think it's harder for us to see how youth, like Christian youth culture has changed, right. Right. but to see how it has should really change how we do yeah. youth ministry. So not only was youth culture different, mm-hmm. it wasn't fractured. We're right. still working in that whole hierarchical, hierarchical can you say well, that? Where the football captain yeah, is the yeah. way to get to everybody in the school. And yeah. we're operating strategically like that when that's not the reality of the culture these kids are in. Think 21 Jump Street was the right. thing he talked right, about, that's right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we still operate under the Breakfast Club model, which mm-hmm. if you've seen Breakfast Club, there are like five or six cultures represented by mm-hmm. kids in the same room and how they interact. Yeah. And you've got the nerds and the jocks and the, you know, mm-hmm. the whatever, the rock and rollers and the you know, the popular girls, that's just not true anymore. Each of those Mm -hmm. cultures is splintered into about a hundred more and they're not as aware of each other as they used to be. Nor do Mm -hmm. they care to be. No, (laughs) right. Yeah. yeah. Like they're just their own thing a lot of times. Yeah. And touching on that is, you know, if you grew up in the eighties or the nineties, it was 
there is a such thing as homogenous culture. Mm -hmm. So it would be, hey, this big event happened, you know, the season finale of Seinfeld or whatever the case may be. And you had everybody watching it and there was this huge moment. We don't have those moments anymore. So especially in youth culture, it moves so quickly, primarily because of technology. So, because it just keeps Mm -hmm. changing and changing and changing. So back then you would have tastemakers who were running, you know, five or six different media companies and you didn't have a lot of selection and there was a barrier to entry. You know, you didn't have a a phone. And so it was like, it was television, it was radio, your options, you know, so the culture didn't shift as quickly now because there are so many different things that are coming from Spotify and Netflix. And it used to be that corporations, now we're getting to an entirely different conversation, but that corporations were the one that told you what you liked and it was driven by them. And now it's a consumer driven culture. And so because of that, you've got millions and millions and millions of voices who are directing culture. Mm -hmm. And so it is just such a living thing that it shifts very quickly. And there's, you can't get your arms around it per se. It is just a constant tension you will always have because you can't just say, hey, we're going to do something that reflects the VMAs like you could have done 10 years ago. That was an event. Right Now there's a million, you know, award shows. And now there's a million different ways that people watch. And Mm -hmm. so you can't, there's no singular thing that you can grab onto. There's just a million different things that, that you have to wrap around in that that's a challenge. Which really raises the bar for youth pastors. Yeah. I mean, they they have to be willing to do a lot more work. Or to gives kind of, them many more bars. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that are raised right. at different yeah. levels. Yeah. It's not the MTV culture anymore? No. Is no. that true? No. Oh. No. No. Hmm. It's a YouTube culture, which has <laughs> yeah. billions of more channels? videos, right. you right. know? And it's like... Students can be their own stars now. So I mean, there's. But I I remember that we would go. To, you'd go to school and you'd be like, "Did you catch Friends last night?" Like that was. You could all rally around. The Simpsons a, came out for us. Yeah. Yeah. Same yeah. Thing, it was yeah. like it was the show, and then you had to watch it because there wasn't DVR to record it. And now mm-hmm. live TV is not like even a th- no. thing anymore. I right. Mean, my students are saying, "Did you catch Friends last night?" <laughs> Because they're all watching it on Netflix. I just read, and I don't have the reference for this, that most students or young people don't even watch TV in real time anymore. I totally believe that. It's all something Mm -hmm. that, it's not, DVR is not even a thing for them. Now it's just on demand, especially with something like Netflix, where it's like, here you go, and they just hand it off to you and you get the whole thing. So it's totally changed. Based on that, I feel um, like I have no shot. So... (laughs) Thanks, As a youth please. worker, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do I leverage culture if by the time I use it or by the time I try to leverage it, it's changed. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, what do we do in this situation? Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's just the nature of how you engage with it has changed. So again, you don't have those big cultural events or even those songs that are huge for, unless it's Despacito, which I mean, that song's been around forever, I, but I, you know, a lot of times you don't, did I say that right, Crystal? What is that? Close enough. Despacito. Oh, guys, I did not do well in Spanish. <laughs> it's so uh, good, Sarah. <laughs> I, got, I got nothing. Yeah, I like, <laughs> you would recognize Grove it. City. So there aren't these yeah, big, <laughs> there aren't these right. big cultural events or big cultural milestones necessarily in youth culture to grab onto. So you're right. I mean, it is a lot more challenging. It's not impossible, but again, it's like most of the things we talk about. It's a conversation. So it's something that it's just a continuing dialogue that you're having with students, that you're having with culture. And there's no way you're going to stay on top of all of it, but you know, you're, you're basically building currency that you can even have those other conversations that are really important. Steve, I think something you said was so important that it's, it's all conversation. It's not go watch this one show or, right. you know, consume this one radio station or media outlet. It's have conversations with real teenagers mm-hmm. and go spend time with real teenagers in their real worlds. I think there's such value to hanging out with whoever the students are that you serve in the place where they normally live. Right. So outside the walls of your church, whether that's at sporting events at their school or, um, or at theater performances or, or dance stuff. Or I actually, a couple of years ago when I wasn't leading a small group, I signed up to substitute teach a few times a year just so I could be in like students' worlds a little bit more and hear the words that they say when they're not at church. Which yeah. are, are a lot of words. <laughs> they, <don't think, laughs> they they do not think they can hear that we can hear them. Yeah. It's an amazing. Th- As a teacher, I would always just be like, "Wow, you really don't think I'm in the room?" Crystal, I love what you just said that we have to engage them outside of the walls of our church because I think sometimes we think we can be culturally relevant inside the walls of our church and it'll be just as effective. But if we really want to know what they're experiencing, then it's got to be on their terms. I love that. Thanks. <laughs>
<laughs> and don't think just physical places. Like, right. yes, the football game's important. Yes, the classroom's important. It's a little harder to, you know, be a substitute teacher. I, and I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that's a good idea for most of the you. The requirements aren't as high <laughs> as you would think. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying the requirements are high. I'm just saying... It's really hard, and they pay <laughs> you nothing. I know that. It is true. For a fact. But um, but to engage them, but social media is that. You're engaging yeah. them on their turf in a yeah. lot of ways. So That's good. One of the things that our colleague CJ said, um, who often hosts this podcast, and I thought it was super smart, is he said every day he and his wife watch the top 10 or top 20 trending oh, yeah. videos on YouTube. Yeah. And I thought that was genius. I started doing that. I started that going home, genius. and whatever's trending... I just watch it and sometimes I'm really sorry I did. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it's really helpful. What was the best video you saw? I can't think of the best. I, the I can only think about the fact that yesterday I saw someone lance a pimple and I wish I hadn't. <laughs> wow. And I can't get it out of my brain. <laughs> That's and terrible. now you can't get it out nope, of yours. Now, <laughs> thank you for that. I was thinking it would involve cats or Definitely something. Definitely worthy of trending. Oh, yes. So gross. <laughs> for all the wrong reasons. Yes. So it, it feels like the overall tension that all youth pastors or youth workers are experiencing is that you really can't win, that culture is this huge thing and it's always changing and we're never going to be able to compete with what it can offer. Well, I don't know that we're trying to compete and that's what we've got to be careful about. Right. But I think we should pay attention to culture and that we as the church should figure out ways to offer kids something that culture could never offer. I mean, we know culture is going to be inconsistent mm -hmm. and we can be consistent. You know, we know culture is always going to be, end up being judgmental. It's amazing. Social media has just allowed that to, right. to happen and we can be accepting. We can mm -hmm. give them a place to truly belong and culture could never compete with that. Mm -hmm. Like if, if we're trying to compete on a music level, we're going to lose that one. If we're going right. to try to compete on a video level, we're going to lose that one. If we're going to compete, try to compete on just a volume of information mm -hmm. level, we're going to lose that one. Mm -hmm. But there are things culture can't do that we should leverage culture to move kids into that place and get them to experience the things that only we can offer as the body of Christ. It feels a little bit like the difference between being reactive and responsive. Yeah. Reactive is going to be, we're going to try to compete with the music and the right. video and that's never going to work. But if we're going to offer a response to what culture is, because culture will drive us to a degree, right. but if we're going to be responsive, then we are going to say that's happening there, but we can offer something different. Right. And I love that idea. I mean, all of that content to, to respond to mm -hmm. just, I mean, you can find it's something, well, it's impossible, yeah. but if you're trying to figure out what to talk, I mean, if you know what you want to talk about, mm -hmm. how easy is it to find content that sets you up? I mean, it, it, there may never, even though I feel like this time it's impossible to win, it might, it might be the best time mm -hmm. in some ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People that I think do this really well, and this, this may sound strange, but I think professional missionaries do this so well because they step into a culture that they are clearly not from. Mm -hmm. And there are so many rules and so many customs and so many nuances of things that they couldn't possibly begin to take on. But they do things to be conversant. They learn, they learn the big chunks to, mm -hmm. to make sure that they honor the culture that they're in, but they also bring what only they have. Like mm -hmm. someone who serves in Ethiopia or serves in Costa Rica isn't going to pretend to be Ethiopian or Costa right. Rican. That'd be weird. But they will learn to be conversant in the culture um, because what they bring to the culture matters so much. Yeah. I love that because it's almost, we can't get rid of culture, but like, how do we enrich it? Mm -hmm. How do we bring what we, what the church has to offer and make it better? I think that's a great example. That's mm -hmm. not strange. Jesus made every environment better he stepped into. Yeah. I love that. And I think we could do that as well. So what would you guys say are some practical ways to keep pace with student culture? You know, the more I think about this and as someone who's worked in a giant church and grew up in a tiny church, I think that um, those of you in small churches really have an advantage here. And... You know, I think you should think about engaging culture through your students more than engaging culture necessarily for your students. And once you understand what's important to them, you understand as much youth culture as you need to understand or want, you know, you may want to understand more, but for the most part, you're trying to connect. The goal of this is better connection mm -hmm. or it should be the goal. So you're saying that because you're a smaller ministry, you have less cultures to learn? Is yeah, that I mean, That's if, a great if, point. If, if what modern youth culture is, is a fractured 
culture, then mm -hmm. the fewer kids you have, the less fractures there yeah. are. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that uh, it might be something you can actually get your hands wrapped around. I think it's a great argument for, you know, relational ministry, small, small groups, groups over mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I mean, when Marco Stryker was here, I said, I think what I heard you say was, Relational ministry has always been the best ministry, mm -hmm. but maybe this time and place is where it's most magnified as a, yeah. a legitimate strategy for reaching kids. That's because a great point. you can't win and right. know all of the kids. But if the, you know, it's a giant um, pyramid plan, right? In right. some ways, it's like I can't reach a hundred kids, but if I can find ten adults to reach ten kids, right? Then I've got a chance. Well, and that's not just true in the church. I know I, I sent you an article recently um, from Adweek. Adweek is just a an organization that shows marketing trends yeah. mm -hmm. about how people are, are using micro influencers on social media right. instead of macro influencers, meaning yeah. we don't get the super popular Instagram person with millions of followers to pump our product. Right. We aim for a hundred people who have Two to 6,000 followers. But different types, right? But right. different yeah. types right. of followers because culture is so shattered and splintered at this point that a micro-influencer will do more for you than one super popular person. And there's almost a distrust of the super popular person mm -hmm. plugging a certain thing. You've got the micro, micro is that what it micro would be? Micro-influencer. Micro-influencer, yeah. they feel like more like one of you. And for you can sure. trust what they're saying more. A it's true because I follow them on yeah. Instagram because yeah. I think they're exactly. Cool. What else would we say are some of the practical things a student pastor, youth pastor could do, or youth worker? If you don't have a Spotify account as a youth worker, I, I just think you should. Mm -hmm. um, and if for no other reason than because there are top charts mm -hmm. that I think reflect what students are listening to far better than a top 40. If it makes it to the top 40 radio station, it is over and done. Interesting. Okay. It's too late. It's that too late. So true. Okay. Well, yeah. there is, every time I open up my Spotify, that first tile is what's trending. What's or happening. What's, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, top four. you should listen to it. Like you should watch the top 10 videos, you YouTube, know, that yes. are trending on YouTube carefully. Carefully. Yeah. carefully. <laughs> so careful. And um, Spotify has trending charts too. Yeah. And there are genres of trending charts. So if your right. students are into pop or acoustic or hot rhythmic or alternative or whatever it is, you can see what's trending for your specific student culture as opposed to trying to get it from the top 40 playlist, which I jokingly call the top 40 for over 40 because oh. students don't listen to it. <laughs> that's a really good point. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. And another thing is, um, you know, when I was growing up, I loved magazines, like the mm -hmm. magazine aisle at the grocery store I thought was super cool, and I won't even name which ones that I read because they're so <laughs> dorky, but I think those entities still exist, just not in the same way. They're mm -hmm. social media accounts now, so you can follow Teen Vogue or Glamour if you're leading girls on Instagram or whatever it is that, that guys are interested in. And you can follow those things. Um, you may not love every article they post or every image, but at least you'll see what sort of information your students are getting. Right. Um, and then the other thing is just follow who they follow. Mm -hmm. I ask my students all the time, hey, who are you following? Who you are the most interesting just look, people? Click on yeah. what, who they're following, yep. yeah. right? Click on yeah. who they're following. Click on who they repost too. Yeah. Whoever mm -hmm. they repost, that's, that's like, awesome. that's the jam. That's, yeah. that's really good. So I'm feeling a little more hopeful as a guy That's who good. is not good at connecting with or paying attention to culture, because uh -huh. I'm thinking, you know, at one point I'm like, I can't possibly keep up with all culture, which I think is true. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is good news because you don't have to keep up with all culture. You just have to keep up with your students. And the more you're paying attention to what your students are doing, the more you're paying attention to what matters to them, which might be doable. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also all. their friends, if yeah. you're trying to engage outsiders or people who are not necessarily churched, you've got more of a chance of reaching them. I love it. So I think there are a couple of things that we are saying that we can do to kind of keep pace with student culture. And 
One of them is to engage culture through students and not for them. Chef, I loved when you said that. We have a end in mind that's not trying to impress them, but we're trying to engage them. And the goal is connection, not just to like look good because we know what's happening. And to find what the church can offer that no one else can. And I think that's probably the most hopeful in all of this, that we are fighting a losing battle when it comes to trying to beat culture or outpace it. But if we can find something unique in the church that no one else is going to have, then we're going to do a great job at the end of the day reaching students. Well, that was a super informative and helpful conversation on how to keep pace with student culture. And thanks for joining us and listening to Rethinking Youth Ministry Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love you to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Your review helps make this podcast better. And finally, if you have a friend in ministry or youth leader who may benefit from learning about student culture and how to engage it, you can send them to our website, rethinkingym.org. Until next time, I'm Sarah. I'm Chef. I'm Crystal. I'm Steve. Thanks for listening.